Here in AIT, the environment is truly international and multicultural, as people who work, study, and live here come from more than 30 countries across Asia and other continents. That's why I have plenty of chances to make new friends and learn about the cultures. The learning experience here in AIT helps students to achieve their full academic potential. The classes here have become a stage for students from different cultural and knowledge backgrounds to discuss issues that matter globally. Being here, I was inspired by the Institute School of Creating Innovative Solutions. My research focuses on novel green tree or biotechnology that recycles, reduces, and reuses our waste. I am certain that the research findings we are doing here at AIT can potentially be applicable globally to make people's lives and environment better and to achieve sustainable development goals. Social impact has been AIT's legacy and is still our positioning today. Social impact permeates our research and our education. We're injecting more innovation and multidisciplinary thinking in our research. We're engaging in more collaboration with globally prestigious universities, including dual degree programs. We're making AIT more relevant by broadening and deepening our network of businesses and NGOs and governments for the benefit of research, internship, and job placement and we're nurturing entrepreneurship and service learning as part of AIT's experiential education. A distinctive feature of our teaching and research programs is their close alignment with some of the major global challenges facing humanity. For example, climate change, energy, food, water security, technology, public policy mismatch, and human-machine fusion. Now, given the innate complexity of these challenges that defy straightforward explanations, our teaching and research programs emphasize multidisciplinarity, cross-thematic considerations, and pragmatic insights into the role of emerging technologies in broader socio-economic contexts. We are working with many universities and governmental organizations in research collaboration and outreach activities. Some of our research findings have already been translated into new government regulations, new engineering standards and practice, and new engineering applications and tools. And I believe our long-term effort has created significant social and economic impact for communities in the region. We believe that our main role is to produce experts who are truly global citizens who can think globally and act locally. Our School of Environment, Resource and Development takes an interdisciplinary approach to study, analyze and solve global and regional sustainable development challenges such as social and gender inequalities, rights and sustainability, urbanization and migration, food security, energy and environment, natural resources and climate change. The best management schools in the world are based on a strong industry involvement with leaders coming from around the world. It's also a place where a culture of innovation is encouraged. At our School of Management, that is the culture we're trying to encourage with regular interaction with organisations and business schools where teaching staff and faculty come from around the world. No idea is discarded and a multidisciplinary approach where collaboration with other schools is supported. The Entrepreneurship Center is supporting AIT students, its faculty and alumni to transform their ideas into tangible outcomes such as prototypes, business plans and startup companies. We aim to bring our experienced AIT alumni and successful entrepreneurs back to the campus to share their experience and stories and to work with our students and faculty to build their dreams here at AIT. 
is not only the knowledge and subject in the classroom, but the way of thinking. Because when we come to work, it's not exactly as it happened in the books. So having AIT experience, so we look at this like a way of life, and I can find many solutions to overcome the obstacle, the problem, and also another thing is initiation. This is the very important thing for the success in the working life. In my personal uh, career, uh, with the knowledge that I have gained from the Asian Institute uh, of Technology, it has been very helpful in uh, dealing with uh, people, in uh, managing my uh, work life, in managing my uh, family life, and also in actually furthering my knowledge through uh, the research uh, capacities that I have gained from the Asian Institute of Technology. Our graduates will be well prepared and have vast opportunities to pursue their passion for social impact by continuing in academia worldwide or joining local or multinational companies or working for socially focused NGOs or becoming government officials or starting their own businesses. So, good evening everyone. Namaste, Swadika. So, welcome everyone to the second webinar series of RSGIS. So, we would like to thank everyone and main, especially the organizing team who worked really hard in preparing for the arrangements. So, especially Dr. Chitrini and Dr. Sanil. Thank you. This is Randhir, working as a project engineer in RSGIS. So, I'll be like a moderator for today's session. And also, I would like to introduce Titimart who will be like my co-moderator. Titima, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Good evening, all. My name is Titima Chongtaku. I am a PhD student in remote sensing and GIS AIT. Yeah. So now, like, yeah, I'm great to be here as a moderator with uh, uh, Ms. Renadia and Dr. Sahas. Thank you. Thank you, Titima. So today's session is on spatial epidemiology focusing on research challenges for future opportunities for prediction of diseases. As we know, this is like a very timely topic focusing on uh, diseases, mainly as we see COVID-19 is a pandemic which is affecting everyone and all the countries in the world. As we see like GIS and remote sensing plays a major role in understanding the spatial epidemiology, uh, helping us in understanding the distribution, occurrence, prevalence of diseases. This will actually support the people who, uh, I think there is some questions. Yeah, which supports the decision makers. So I'm really happy that Dr. Shahzad has agreed to give his talk on spatial epidemiology. And we are proud to say that Dr. Shahzad is actually an alumni of RSGIS department. He has done his PhD at RSGIS. And he, Dr. Shahzad is currently the director at FAST, National University of Computers and Emerging Science in Pakistan. He leads the uh, thematic areas of such as ICT tools for health, agriculture, disaster management, location-based systems, and applications in environment. Dr. Shahzad has com contributed almost 30 plus journals in conferences and international journals. So along with, he has also developed the tools which are used by the international agencies for the assessments. And Dr. Shahzad has conducted the workshops, seminars, which are in line with international and national agencies for the capacity building. Thank you, Dr. Shahzad. So we would like to welcome you to give your talk. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep, uh, and uh, Remote Sensing GIS. And it is my pleasure. So uh, I'm here uh, to give a presentation on spatial epidemiology. 
So uh, let me share the screen. Yeah, we can see the screen, sir. Yes. So uh, as uh, already my introduction has been made, so uh, once again, I'm Dr. Sherpa Sarfras and currently working as an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. And also I'm heading uh, the campus of fast National University of Computers and Emerging Sciences, uh, first global campus. So uh, having background of computer science, because I graduated, I did my bachelor in computer science, and then I moved to AIG in 2008 where I did my master and PhD in remote sensing and GIS. So I graduated from AIT in 2012. So uh, when I uh, enrolled at AIT, so I tried to develop uh, a system which can be uh, useful for prediction uh, diseases. So uh, I did my PhD in collaboration with the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Health, uh, with Sunolog area, so uh, we develop a vector-borne disease system model for prediction of uh, dengue fever. So considering uh, that background, so uh, I changed my area and uh, I uh, engaged myself in uh, remote sensing and GIS application. So uh, currently I am also supervising uh, students, those that are also working uh, in uh, GIS and uh, uh, allied areas uh, in terms of computer science. So uh, let's discuss uh, about today's to uh, topic as it's spatial epidemiology. And uh, uh, today I will discuss the research challenges and future opportunities for prediction of diseases. So I made my presentation considering uh, many uh, master and PhD students are listening this presentation. So considering uh, the current students, uh, I will give uh, the brief introduction uh, what is spatial epidemiology and uh, why disease uh, uh, mapping is important and uh, what type of benefits we can uh, obtain from this, this, this discipline. And uh, later on, uh, definitely uh, we will discuss about the research challenges. Those would like to conduct research in this area, what type of things they need to consider and definitely where are the gaps and what are the future opportunities for those would like to engage themselves in this special epidemiology domain. So uh, let's uh, start with the special epidemiology. So uh, epidemiology basically is uh, the term from epidemics. Uh, more currently you see the COVID-19 uh, is spreading all around the world and affecting millions of people. And uh, uh, a, a lot of people are still afraid uh, with, such time, with this disease. And so everybody is looking for the solution so that they can start their normal life as usual before uh, 2019. So uh, keeping in view, uh, many researchers and many scientists are also using uh, the special epidemiology tools. And the one uh, example is the smart lockdown. So as you know, uh, uh, where we find a number of patients uh, of COVID and we declare it as a, a COVID hotspot and we try to seal that area for around two weeks so that the movement of the people can be stopped so that uh, the disease spread can be avoided. So similarly, special uh, epidemiology is the description and analysis of geographical health data with respect to demographic, environment, and socioeconomic factor. So uh, in terms of special epidemiology, we see uh, why this disease is occurring and in wh which area this is occurring and what are the factors, either this can be socioeconomic, environmental, or demographic factor. And similarly, uh, after uh, getting the information, we try to map it so that it can, uh, so the visual representation of this uh, complex uh, phenomena can be observed and the quick information can be obtained. 
the main uh, area and the main focus we remain to find again find the correlation so what type of factors are influencing uh, in terms of uh, this uh, uh, outbreak or the epidemic so uh, again uh, after getting the correlation, we try to find the disease cluster, the hotspots where uh, these uh, uh, case, uh, pay, uh, number of uh, cases are occurring. So sometimes a greater than expected number of cases of a disease occurs in a group of people living or working in the same area. So we try to find the hidden trends. So uh, try to map the uh, uh, more number of cases that is said to be as disease clusters. And similarly, uh, disease surveillance uh, is an important factor so that we timely predict and observe and minimize the harm caused by the outbreak. So for example, we want to see, okay, in this region, we have this specific type of disease. So uh, what type of precautionary measures can be taken uh, to avoid uh, this outbreak in the other region, so epidemic and pandemic situations, to identify the factors contributing to such circumstances so that we can control and uh, monitor uh, these uh, factors. So these are the basic uh, uh, terminologies which are being used in terms of spatial epidemiology. So we need to understand uh, why uh, we need disease mapping and what is geographical correlation and uh, why we need to map the cluster and what is the importance of surveillance. So if I summarize this presentation, so we uh, our focus is a uh, whole disease is spreading in terms of uh, uh, location, considering the location, so that the other factors uh, like environmental and demographic factors can be identified. So uh, definitely uh, location is very important factor uh, in terms of any phenomena, not only spatial epidemiology, but even if you are uh, planning uh, anything, uh, in multidisciplinary approaches, so you need uh, the location, so it predicts, uh, it provides you better prediction facilities. So many of uh, us are uh, using uh, GIS uh, applications, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, having uh, not background of uh, GIS, we think uh, this application is only limited uh, scope. But nowadays, every uh, application is using this location-based systems. Like, for example, if you check in into Facebook, you turn on your location and you mark the check-in location. If you are using the WhatsApp group, you are sending, sharing the locations, you are tracing, you are finding the routes. So everywhere, um, uh, we are using uh, GIS-based application. So um, many databases are have been converted uh, to location-based system. So similarly, uh, this is uh, the overall uh, uh, background about uh, how GIS is important, but in terms of uh, Infectious diseases, it is also very important because we need uh, to know uh, the behavior of the uh, factors around that location. So, for example, if we have a hotspot in some area, so we need to see uh, where are the nearest hospitals, where are the uh, emergency points, or where where are the other routes where this disease can be spread or we can uh, control or prevent people from spreading this uh, disease. So uh, location has influence and geospatial can provide intelligence. So no uh, different uh, location-based intelligence system, AI-based deep learning, machine learning based approaches are being used for prediction of diseases. And uh, definitely spatial analysis can assist in solving uh, medical problems so that we can uh, reduce the disease burden. So uh, th this is uh, a generic uh, present uh, slide for, uh, for considering uh, because the disease is a complex phenomena. Uh, so it's quite difficult to understand through one factor. So there are multiple factors involved in disease mapping. For example, if we take uh, a vector-borne disease as an example. So uh, you see uh, that disease uh, is a complex phenomena. So it consists of uh, the environmental factors, 
like uh, the land use and the socioeconomic factor, the housing type and water supply, income, climate. So these are the different environmental factors which can uh, trigger uh, the disease to occur. And then similarly, the host, for example, uh, if there is no host, then that definitely there will be no disease. And uh, like human uh, gets specific disease. And uh, similarly, there is another contributor who uh, plays an important role to spread the disease. So uh, like in terms of vector-borne diseases, there can be AIDS, malaria, and uh, leishmania, and many other uh, vectors that can spread and cause uh, specific disease. And But uh, considering the COVID-19, a uh, human is also playing as a vector or as a role for spreading uh, disease. So uh, this is a, a complex phenomena which we need to understand before mapping, before implementing any type of disease. So if anyone would like to uh, conduct research in uh, special ophthalmology, uh, definitely uh, they know to understand uh, what type of factors is uh, involved uh, in terms of uh, disease spreading and what are the causes, what are the roots, so that the better planning uh, for disease mapping can be made and a proper uh, uh, geospatial systems can be implemented. So uh, when we start spatial ophthalmology research, so we need to consider the three type of uh, points that is the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution and the spectral resolution. So spatial resolution is very important. For example, if you are going to uh, uh, extract the information that is causing due to some vegetation, so maybe uh, you, you can start research with a very rough resolution. But if you need to uh, monitor uh, the house pattern or the house type and the con condition of that areas, then definitely you need very high resolution. So sometimes uh, the researcher or the students say, okay, if I get a satellite image, then I can start the research. But before getting a satellite image, you need to know what type of features you want to extract. So either that uh, resolution uh, will answer your uh, query or not. So for example, as I already gave you an example, if you are going to uh, extract the vegetation, then definitely uh, the resolution can be lower. But if you want to see the house types and the building types, then definitely you need a high resolution image. And the second parameter is the temporal resolution, uh, the revisit time uh, of uh, satellite and when you will uh, acquire the next image. So it is also very important to know uh, because for example, if you are uh, uh, going to predict a waterborne disease or uh, the, uh, the diseases causes due to flood, and uh, you cannot wait for seven days or 15 days uh, of a next image. So you need a very quick uh, revisit time to monitor the flood so that you can predict what's happening in the coming days or the next two or three days. And uh, the last one is the spectral resolution. Uh, uh, definitely, it is also very important what type of uh, object you are looking for from the satellite image. So if uh, you are looking uh, affect uh, some uh, object which is not visible in uh, the first three or four bands, then definitely you need to uh, get a satellite uh, uh, image which has a spectral resolution which can identify your uh, answer. So these are the basically three points before acquiring, before selecting any type of data in terms of satellite image. Then definitely, of course, the other uh, the supplementary data, like I already uh, mentioned in the previous slide, like the socioeconomic factors, the climate data, and uh, other socioeconomic data, demographic data, you need also that supplementary data which need to be plotted on your satellite image. So uh, this is uh, a study uh, which Vincent et al. Uh, did uh, in 2007, uh, 2007. And uh, this is uh, also by uh, 
uh, our teacher Mark Suresh or because his area is also special epistemology. So I was very impressed with this article because before starting the research, uh, what they did, they tried a literature review in which they find uh, the last 15 year data. So what type of diseases, infectious diseases or vector borne diseases has been uh, carried out through remote sensing and GIS application. So in the left-hand side, they mentioned all the uh, diseases which can uh, cause the infectious and vector-borne diseases. So they find out the total number of studies, for example, Chlora 1, Lyme 6, and similarly, uh, different type of diseases uh, they have mentioned here. So uh, they try to find what type of satellite images has been used by these studies. So they put like NOAA, Landsat, SPOT, or other type of studies, or other type of satellites uh, they have used for their studies. So uh, you can easily see here, uh, there are uh, clearly a few number of studies which has used NOAA, Landsat, and other. Uh, so from here, you can see uh, the total number of studies, uh, 86 were used and uh, out of 86, 43 studies have used the NOAA satellite data for disease mapping and similarly 35. So uh, similarly, what type of uh, parameters they try to extract from uh, the images, uh, some studies try to extract the NDVI so that on the basis of, because few, uh, diseases occur due to a specific vegetation like malaria occur due to some specific uh, uh, forest uh, so uh, they can breed there and can be, uh, play a role as a host and similarly some uh, some studies try to find land cover and land use uh, so that the uh, housing pattern and other things can be identified uh, so that uh, the hidden factors can be identified on the basis of uh, these extraction. And few st studies also try to find the temperature and the other parameters from these satellite. So such type of studies and the literature review can help you in understanding the what recent uh, tools and technologies are being used for disease mapping. So if you are going to start a research in spatial epidemiology, so I would suggest to take this paper as an example and write down the list of diseases which you want to map or on which you want to continue. And then similarly, try to find what type of satellite images they have used and what type of parameters they have extracted. And then from uh, this, uh, from these facts, you can identify uh, what next is required and what they were unable to achieve, so that you can uh, make your uh, uh, you can refine your objectives from uh, this literature. So this is another example uh, of uh, <coughs> disease mapping, uh, which has been done by uh, Lois et al. So they have also mentioned uh, the factors and the number of uh, studies for which region they have done and uh, which country and what scale uh, they have done. And this, uh, in disease mapping, the scale is a very important factor. Uh, because if you are going to map uh, urban area, so definitely you need uh, high resolution images. And if you are going to uh, map the rural area, so maybe you not need very high much resolution. So sometimes uh, some studies have conducted both urban and rural area for disease mapping. So uh, this is again uh, a fact about the dinghy data and the publication year for, for example, from 1998 to 2013. Uh, what type of studies has been done and uh, what type of factors they try to find out. For example, if you see uh, study one uh, was conducted in 2008 and they, uh, they used environmental parameters and remote sensing uh, images and only one studies was done by this author. So similarly, uh, this is the number of years data for example, they have used five-year data. So if you see here, uh, 
this research has been done only on the basis of one year data. So similarly, this research has been done only on the basis of one year data. Sometimes uh, uh, you have listened uh, from the reviewers or from uh, your seniors, the one year data is not enough for, to predict some behavior of phenomena. Definitely, of course, if we have uh, multiple years data, then uh, it will give more accuracy uh, in prediction. But of course, you can start prediction uh, on the basis of one year data as well. So when I was a student at uh, AIT, uh, so the, uh, my first paper was published in uh, two plus impact factor on the basis of one year data. So the reviewers also make objection. So like, uh, do you think one year data is enough? So because uh, we splitted this one year data into multiple uh, uh, in multiple months, so on the basis of different months, we uh, presented that definitely uh, this one year data uh, will be enough uh, to achieve the objective which has been documented. And of course, by adding multiple years data, uh, we will get more accuracy. So again, this the paper was published and accepted uh, in two plus uh, impact factor. So, uh, this is my advice, like if you have uh, even uh, one year uh, uh, data, so at least you can implement, you can analyze the spatial temporal uh, parameter for disease mapping uh, on the monthly basis or weekly basis. So at least you can identify uh, some uh, trends. So uh, if I see uh, the uh, the categories of predictors, uh, the 21 predictor for population data has been used. And then similarly, 14 uh, researchers use uh, the demographic data and then socioeconomic data. So uh, there are a few studies that also use entomological data. So in uh, disease mapping, uh, it is quite hard to get entomological data and very few organizations uh, uh, record uh, entomological data. So uh, in my point of view, uh, if we have uh, entomological data, uh, it can give you more prediction uh, for disease mapping because this is the source where the disease is uh, started and occurred. And when they uh, complete their incubation period, so you can easily map and predict uh, disease, uh, disease phenomena. So uh, in terms of uh, algorithms and uh, uh, type of methods, so uh, this is another approach. So if I would like to see in the last 10 years, what type of uh, approaches has been used for disease mapping. So for example, uh, we have shortlisted the 26 uh, publication and uh, here we have write down the methods which they have used for example, spatial analysis of case cluster hotspots. So it has been noted that the study two uh, has used this approach and then study number five has used this approach, seven, eight. So total number of 10 studies has used spatial analysis of case cluster hotspots. And similarly, uh, there are other methods, geographical weighted regression, maximum entropy, uh, water associated diseases index. So definitely in disease mapping uh, index approach like NDVI water index, uh, bear land index, uh, other different type of indexes also has very important in mapping uh, diseases. So from here, again, I can find out uh, continuous risk level, uh, approach has been used by 18 researchers and descriptive map, uh, appro maps approach has been used by 19 uh, researchers. So this is the basic approach, descriptive maps, like just we uh, plot our uh, cases data and the patient data and the hospital data and describe this in terms of location. Okay, it has been observed that in this area, there are uh, many number of cases occurring so descriptive is a very basic approach which is being used by uh, almost every researcher during the publication process. But if you see the early warning systems, a very few 
uh, researcher has uh, used uh, such type of systems for disease mapping. So uh, from here, uh, this graph we can see from this table, like uh, we have uh, again, uh, uh, we can understand what type of methods are being used for disease mapping. So it can give us the idea so till uh, in last decade, what researcher has done. So now uh, moving uh, forward, uh, let's discuss about uh, the challenges uh, which uh, we face uh, during uh, special ophthalmology. And even I think uh, other type of uh, research uh, have to go through these challenges. And the first one is uh, the interface uh, challenge. So uh, as the data is being presented to a user for consumption, so many users face uh, different type of challenges uh, to provide interactive uh, maps and uh, definitely web-based searching and filtering information is required and the user would like to uh, extract information without any hassle. So for example, uh, there is a GIS uh, geo portal from where you want to retrieve or extract the data. So user want easiness instead of uh, uh, going through a hassle process. So uh, just write down the area name and select the date and the number of weeks from week one to week seven uh, data is required. So such type of uh, interface uh, are still required. Uh, in developing uh, uh, special ophthalmological uh, 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 software applications. So uh, many uh, organizations also provide the APIs to acquire data and uh, now many researchers are using APIs uh, for integrating their data. And uh, definitely uh, surveillance, retrieval of surveillance data uh, through uh, interactive interface is also a challenge. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, the user also face uh, challenges in scrapping the data because uh, many uh, computer scientists try to scrap the data from different websites, uh, from the news archives or from the different uh, geo portals. But if the organization change uh, their structure and uh, your application will not work, so you have to rewrite your code for uh, getting the information. So modifying the layout, uh, scrapper shall result into the issues. And uh, sometimes we also need to consider the ethical issues uh, being faced for uh, scrapping the data. So we need to be very careful. Uh, we are following the terms and conditions provided by the uh, data provider. So uh, similarly, there are issues in uh, data reporting challenges because uh, uh, there is a lag in the time. For example, uh, there are a uh, number of cases uh, in this week, but we get the result after one week. So the lag of one week or uh, the delay in the data reporting also uh, uh, gives you inaccurate uh, prediction of your disease. So like COVID-19, if we get delayed data and uh, maybe uh, after a few time, the patient get recovered from the disease and that data will be not quite useful uh, for uh, analyzing and for prediction other diseases. And the data format challenges uh, also because we are getting data from different uh, organizations, from different platforms. So every organization is using a different type of data. So you need to convert that data to make uh, a uniform uh, system. So it also uh, cost or take time to convert uh, data formats into a single or into same uh, level. So when you try to collect uh, data, so many uh, students need to convert uh, data as per their requirement. And of course, uh, uh, the data availability and the quality is uh, also issue. So uh, still we need to develop such type of system where we can easily find uh, data and it should be of uh, high quality 
and uh, not only high quality and availability data, but for special epidemiology, you need your reference data. So without location, because many uh, organizations provide you data, number of cases, even sometimes they provide you the address, but it is quite difficult to make them geocode or plot as per your uh, other data. So experience uh, assessment and design issues are there. Uh, for example, if you are going to uh, assess uh, exposure in specific region and you plot a buffer like five kilometer and 10 kilometer on the assumptions like this disease cannot spread for more than five kilometer or more than 10 kilometer. So it may give you inaccurate result. Uh, there is a possibility like this disease can spread even more than five kilometer or there is a possibility uh, many people uh, not get uh, such type of disease within the five kilometer. So for exposure assessment, we need to design a system uh, very carefully. And the last one challenge is data protection, uh, protection and confidentially in terms of uh, disease. Uh, so we have, every human has a privacy even uh, uh, nowadays, uh, COVID is very common and the people try to hide uh, themselves like they don't have uh, uh, COVID and they isolate themselves and just tell uh, we are taking rest, something like that. So uh, data protection and confidentially is a very important thing which need to be addressed uh, before mapping any disease epidemiology. So uh, let's uh, moving forward uh, to future uh, directions. Uh, uh, the mobility, uh, nowadays the mobility is the biggest challenge uh, in disease mapping. So uh, it has been also uh, proved during COVID uh, like human mobility and movement seems to have much greater influence than previously thought. So before this, it was uh, considered like the disease is only specific to a specific region, but no, uh, because of mobility, transportation, and this disease outbreak are spreading all around the world. So before this, it was said that like the dengue fever is uh, only tropical uh, disease. It cannot be spread in other regions. But no, uh, with the change of uh, temperature and all the things, uh, the disease is spreading uh, and changing its scale and the level. And uh, the other important factor is the scale. Now, definitely when you are getting data from different sensors, different uh, forums, different platforms, you will get different type of maps, uh, serve different purposes and have different roles in public health application. And the scale is very important. For example, if you are getting temperature uh, of one kilometer at one kilometer scale and you are getting humidity at uh, uh, 500 meter scale. So you need to uh, address these issues before analyzing the spatial epidemiology. And then integration of the other uh, data, as I uh, tell in the previous slide, the disease is a complex phenomena. So we need integration uh, for uh, multiple data sets to find the risk of the disease. And the last uh, thing is uh, we need to develop an early warning system. A model could reproduce only large outbreak, for example, where sometimes early warning system gives us a very large outbreak, but not the smaller one. And those smaller uh, outbreaks can lead to a larger outbreaks, which uh, uh, remained ignored uh, during implementation of uh, early warning system. So optimal resource allocation and steering of intervention in space and time is required for this. Uh, considering you no know, the future, uh, the AI-based algorithms uh, are being used uh, in disease mapping, and this is the recent article, which is uh, published by Joshi in 2020 or 21, uh, just a few months earlier. So they have uh, you analyzed uh, how many number of studies uh, are using different type of algorithm. So for example, if you see in this graph, the decision tree 
algorithm is widely used uh, for by many researchers and similarly it in uh, the decision tree algorithms uh, includes the random forest card xg boost and regression trees and uh, almost similar uh, uh, algorithms or approaches of artificial neural networks are being used by many researchers and then the sport vector machine and the maxnet and the nave based and other type of studies and k nearest neighbor so uh, these are the different uh, algorithms which are being used for uh, uh, using uh, machine learning approaches for prediction of uh, diseases uh, in different areas and considering uh, the language infograph so sometimes uh, the researcher those start special epidemiology and they need to implement gis based systems they also uh, try to analyze which type of language which type of platform they need to use this is a recent graph uh, which has been uh, acquired in march 2020 so as compared to last year at the moment uh, majority of the researcher are using python uh, because it has a quite flexibility uh, in uh, term of development of different applications and uh, then definitely java and the javascripting is being used for developing uh, different uh, gis based applications so um, considering this uh, i would suggest uh, to uh, get a grip on python and try to develop and try to write the co code basic codes in python and then use your own libraries and try to develop own libraries for implementing uh, disease prediction algorithms so uh, one uh, another thing is uh, you know, when you are trying to acquire the information as i said uh, in this slide uh, let me get back uh, exposure assessment or the data reporting so we uh, need geolocation data set Uh, to integrate uh, non location based system into geo coding system so there are different type of system so uh, during last covid we, we here at university develop a system from where we can analyze and map uh, okay sir so we uh, during covid 19 we try to map what type of uh, issues are being faced by the student at home because we started online uh, classes so we try to develop this system let me show you if i can so my this the web page is visible and i need to uh, no sir can you please share it once again Okay. Uh not yet. So no visible? Not uh, yet, yes. sir. So you have yes, right now we can see the uh, web interface. Okay. So uh, this system was uh, developed by my lab to understand the difficulties uh, of the students living at different location so we try to implement it uh, so only national university students can log in here so it verify the credentials like if they are from the nu domain uh, then they can sign in and can submit uh, their information otherwise this form was not accessible to them so i hope uh, the web page is uh, visible Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see. So uh, we try to implement uh, the student internet connectivity and quality of teaching survey. So here, the student can write their name and the uh, identification, and then father name and the campus. As we have multiple campus uh, in uh, Pakistan, so at the moment we have five campuses. So uh, the student can select the campus name and then. uh from where the residence he was like uh, from islamabad lahore or other he can select any type of uh, 
uh, the district from where they belong. And then we try to uh, take the postal address so that we can also convert that into geocode other if uh, the student remained unable to map here. So we facilitated students because as I told, it's quite difficult for uh, uh, user those does not have the background of uh, GIS this system. So they can just type uh, the area like, for example, I write here D ground. So uh, they can select, okay, this is uh, the area where I am living. So from here, uh, it automatically record the latitude and longitude of the student at the back end of the database. And then we select, okay, for what degree program uh, the student is registered, either bachelor, master, and then the discipline. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, business administration, civil engineering, cybersecurity, data science, whatever. And similarly, we try to get the landline number, WhatsApp number, and the best way of contacting you during this lockdown period, like through email, mobile phone, WhatsApp, so that we can easily approach uh, the student for online classes or any information we need to provide during lockdown period. So this system was developed in last April, uh, April or March uh, 2020, last year when we faced first time uh, COVID uh, situation in the country. So uh, we also try to get, okay, what type of mobile packages they are using like 3G or 2G or less, because in Pakistan, we are having a few areas which is uh, having deficiency of uh, proper internet facilities. So we can also understand the student need, either we need to send uh, uh, some material through post if they don't have uh, the proper uh, mobile uh, internet. And then uh, these are the uh, company providers so that we, we can also analyze either which type of company they are using. So if we need to provide the packages, uh, uh, internet packages to the students, we can also do that. So similarly TV home. So this, these are the different uh, questions which we asked. And then definitely at the end, we confirm the roll number and then uh, try to get the authentication so that uh, a proper legal user can submit this form. So from this, we uh, plotted all the data. Uh, uh, we plotted all the data uh, on the web map so that we can understand from where uh, the user are, are having difficulties in getting quality of education. And we also took their feedback to improve quality of instruction or what type of deficiency they are facing during this COVID. So uh, this is the tool because uh, we, uh, we are having the computer science background and we can develop a software, but there is another example. If you can see my screen here, uh, this is a tool, uh, developed by uh, the RGIS uh, online. So GIS users, it's the other data that's harder to make sense of. For our data to provide the answers we need, we first had to ask the questions that make our data relevant. So I think uh, there is uh, maybe some browsing issue. So this is a survey one, two, three application. Uh, use. And, and now our GIS users have a new way to ask. Presenting survey one, two, three for our GIS is the best way to collect high. So I think uh, there is a browsing issue, so I can stop this video, but uh, I can share the link and I will yes. slide will be available. So 
Uh, it's okay, sir. You can share the link link in the chat box so people can actually view it. Okay. Okay, I think no screen will be available. Yes, 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 you can see. So I have shared the link. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can so continue with the presentation. This is this is an easy way uh, of collecting uh, GIS based location survey. For example, nowadays Google survey is very uh, common. Uh, everyone is using uh, Google survey to collect data. So survey ArcGIS gives you uh, the facility that you can uh, collect data uh, using location. So uh, people can easily mark their location and uh, the file that you will get uh, will have the coordinate uh, with, with you. So similarly, there's another tool, Mango uh, Apps, Maps, which is being used for uh, a different type of uh, web-based application. And uh, there are a few examples of geocoding APIs. For example, uh, let me try this if again uh, I can show. Um, so we cannot see this new okay, screen. Just, just yeah. Yes, we can see that. Okay, so for example, uh, no, this is uh, an example of uh, API for converting geocoding. So if you don't have uh, uh, the latitude and longitude, you can just uh, simply write a background. Uh, right, so it, it provides you the latitude and longitude of that specific area. So you can convert uh, your address into latitude, longitude. So this type of APIs can be used. So you, if you have a data in the CSV file or the Excel file, so by importing and by including this API, you can get your all addresses into latitude and longitude information. So some type of tools are quite useful. Uh, in implementing spatial epidemiology tools. So uh, at the, so my screen is visible, I hope so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, let's conclude uh, this presentation. So uh, as earlier I said, uh, the disease phenomena, disease mapping is uh, a complex and unpredictability of uh, infectious disease is still a challenge for health managers because several factors contribute to outbreak. So we need to understand uh, these all factors. And of course, geoinformation tool is quite useful to map urban and peri-urban environment to uh, identify the disease clusters. And uh, nowadays, there are uh, many freely available data and uh, real-time plastic approaches are quite useful in disease mapping. So availability of data uh, is, uh, uh, has been improved as compared to previous years. So such type of uh, freely available data can give us more prediction and better result. And excellent approach, especially in financially deficient developing countries. So freely available data is quite useful where, uh, for the countries where they have very limited resources for uh, health uh, mapping and for managing health affairs. So uh, geospatial technologies can better represent the interaction of environmental factor and disease such as seasonal or temporal 
temporal changes, living style, houses condition, or other natural events. So uh, as the GIS and the geospatial tools has the beauty, we can overlay multiple factors and multiple phenomena all together, and we can analyze all these things. So which gives us uh, a better result. And uh, such type of overlays and integration of multiple layers is not possible uh, without GIS based applications. So at the end, uh, these are few uh, useful uh, data sources for uh, extracting data in terms of diseases. You can get uh, multiple disease information data from WHO. And similarly, you can access freely satellite images to uh, NASA portal and similarly uh, other forums like the University of Melbourne. And the last link is uh, the journals. Uh, uh, which you can, uh, if you are interested in finding and publishing health GIS research, so this link can provide you the information of getting information uh, of uh, uh, useful literature in this domain. That's all for uh, today, and thank you very much for giving me opportunity to uh, discuss on uh, the special epidemiology topics. Thank you very much. And if you have any question, you are most welcome to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shahas. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shahas, for the presentations. I am very grateful to you for the amazing presentation. It's very clear and very effective the way in your presence. It's very helpful for many researchers and students who is interested in uh, epidemiology uh, based on geo spatials. Let me summarize some uh, presentation. Okay, as you may know, right? He mentioned that uh, disease is a complex phenomena. So, that's why we want to know the, uh, and also understand the environment factor, this is contributor as such. So that's why uh, location is very important because of geospatial can provide intelligence and spatial analysis can also assist in solving not only for medical problem and other uh, environmental problem as well. But once when you start doing a uh, thesis, you have to know that the point to consider routing the data selection such as spatial, uh, temporal, and also spectral resolution as well. For the uh, list of sharings in the future, so we have to know at least four points from his presentation. First, we have to know the scale and uh, we have to know that mobility and how to integrate all the data in order to build the early warning system. And also we have to concern about the overview of data and also the data formats and reference to access all the data. At least, uh, moreover, uh, we have another uh, future opportunity in terms of use of advanced mobile-based application and also AI-based DC in the uh, DC predictions. So we have uh, uh, useful data for many sources like WHO or NASA and other existing journals. Last but not least, you may know, right? Uh, the unpredictability and complexity of this infected disease, like for example, this now the COVID-19, the pandemic that we are facing is still challenge for the health management because of we have several factors to concern that contribute this outbreak. And also that we can know that the uh, geospatial technology can better represent the interaction between of the environmental and uh, the factor of the disease. And right now we uh, welcome for the question from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Pitima. Thank you for nicely summarizing the entire session. And th thank you, Dr. Seth. Thank you, Dr. Shehzad. So this webinar has been live, live broadcasted in Facebook in RSGIS webpage. 
So we received some questions in that also, as well as in chat box of Zoom. So may I ask the first question, sir? So first question is that, like how Pakistan is coping up with COVID situation? What is the role of spatial epidemiology in this? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this question. So uh, as I told before, uh, going to Thailand uh, in AIT, I don't know about the spatial epidemiology and either I have to uh, be part of uh, medical doctor's team so this was a new area, and I uh, remember at during uh, in 2009 was an outbreak of dengue in Pakistan. A specialized uh, team from Pakistan visited AIT for getting uh, special epidemiology information, and they also visited different hospitals like Mahidol and uh, other. Uh, uh, hospitals uh, to adopt the challenges and the techniques being uh, used by Thai government. So uh, it was my pleasure at that time. I was working with Professor Nitin, and uh, uh, we uh, I I also presented uh, my topic. Uh, how we are predicting dinghy in that area. So nowadays, uh, Pakistan is also uh, working uh, in a great way for predicting disease. Uh, and they have also developed different tools and uh, the technologies uh, for prediction uh, disease. So uh, recently, if I show you, uh, there is a dashboard I have just, uh, let me share. So like you see, uh, if my... Uh, yes, we can see, sir. Yes, so uh, we have the COVID-19 uh, dashboard, so where, from where you can find all the statistics at the moment, the uh, number of confirmed cases and deaths recovered and uh, all the things. So uh, it is uh, Pakistan cases detailed and we have, we, uh, our government is mapping all uh, the facts and figure in all areas. And if, so on the basis of these uh, special uh, tools and technologies, they are also uh, highlighting the hotspot areas and also implementing the smart lockdowns so that the movement of the people can be stopped in that specific areas. So uh, these type of tools and technologies uh, are also being used by the Pakistan government. Brilliant. So there is one more question from the audience. So he wants to know, can machine, machine teaching approaches be implemented along with the machine learning for the improvement of classification regression problems in spatial epidemiology? Can you please answer that, sir? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, sure. Can machine teaching approaches be implemented along with machine learning techniques? So for the improvement of classification, regression problems in spatial epidemiology. Yes, of course, nowadays uh, the new uh, trends and the new technologies are being used like the random forest, uh, as I already mentioned in my presentation. So sport vector machines and many other algorithms are being implemented, are being used. So uh, the other traditional uh, approaches like uh, clustering, and regression, uh, these were uh, used for just descriptive analysis, but no uh, to find the hidden trends, uh, which is not possible uh, for uh, the normal human being. So uh, all the hospitals and all the ophthalmologists and the medical health managers are using these type of tools and technologies for better understanding of diseases. And of course, uh, these tools and technologies are quite helpful for prediction of uh, diseases. Thank you, sir. So, so for, yes, the, yeah, one, one, one more, one questions from our side. Uh, thus, we want to know any new programs are launched by the national and loca local body to understand the spatial data, like mainly younger uh, generations in Pakistan? So uh, when I started uh, my uh, degree program at AIT, so at that time we did not have much programs in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time only uh, 
few universities were offering master degree program, only master degree program, but there was no bachelor degree of remote sensing and GIS in Pakistan. But uh, nowadays, uh, almost uh, I can easily say many universities are using uh, and adopting uh, these type of uh, tools and technologies for their undergrad program. So no, the Bachelor in Geoinformatics uh, has been started in Pakistan and similarly MS and uh, the PhD programs has also started in Pakistan. Uh, uh, not only in GIS, so rather they are also uh, offering the different domains like space sciences, earth sciences, so uh, natural disaster management programs so, so uh, we are, uh, you know, so Pakistan is also contributing and uh, uh, giving education and geospatial technologies as well. Thank you, sir. And one more question, like uh, how is private sector working in remote sensing and GIS, sir? Like what are the job opportunities? So uh, definitely uh, in, Private sector Please. in Pakistan, yeah. it's not largely uh, being used. Yeah. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Okay, absolutely. but but there are different private organizations. Uh, those are working like Park One Health and uh, uh, some other organization who are uh, dealing uh, with the NGOs and the, with the UN. So UN offices in Pakistan and different NGOs uh, are doing and uh, plotting uh, the survey and conducting such type of studies. But it's not very common and uh, like you uh, can not see very easily in every organization, but definitely uh, at the regional level and the country level, different uh, NGOs and they have also collaboration with private companies for uh, mapping diseases. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you for your answer. So another question from uh, audience size. So uh, she asked like what GIS tool can be used to analyze the global transmissions and predict of the novel coronavirus pandemic. And also what the methods and formulas can be used and what kind of uh, spatial tool can be used to estimate of the, the spread of these okay. pandemics across the globe? So. Okay, so uh, in my point of view, uh, still uh, the COVID-19 uh, mapping is a challenge, but definitely it, it, it is providing the aid. GIS uh, and the geospatial tools are providing the aid uh, mm -hmm. in identifying uh, the disease. So uh, one tool, uh, because the tool has been asked, the link analysis, uh, is quite uh, useful for identifying the movement and the cases being spread from one place to another places. So uh, we can uh, predict the path and the carrier's movement from one place to another place. So we can restrict uh, uh, these movement for specific areas to spread it at a, a inter international and national level. Okay, thank you for the, the uh, answer, sir. And another question, uh, he asked like, can we use thermal infrared temperature satellite imaged with very high resolution to identify human body temperature? So uh, maybe uh, if we can, the answer is very simple. If we can see if see the human being, then definitely we can predict the uh, uh, human body temperature from thermal sensors. So if we cannot uh, visualize human being from the satellite, so definitely it's quite difficult uh, because the person is moving from one place to another place. If it's static, static then uh, maybe there is a possibility of uh, identification of uh, uh, the thermal uh, uh, temperature uh, from human, but when definitely the objects are moving, it's quite difficult at the moment to predict uh, uh, thermal uh, temperature, uh, the temperature of human from uh, the infrared image. But definitely by installing the IoT based uh, solutions, like we install different uh, 
uh, thermal sensors at different locations, uh, and we uh, give uh, we uh, get the location of uh, that thermal sensors, and we integrate with the web-based technologies. Then definitely it will help a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So finally, we can conclude by your message. What is your message for the new upcoming researcher who are working in health GIS sector, sir? Uh, uh, for uh, the new uh, generation or? The, I yes. mean, the person who wants to get into health GIS mainly. So what is your key Okay, message? so uh, my advice is uh, to engage yourself by learning new innovative tools. So this is the main success uh, in spatial epidemiology uh, field, not only in spatial epidemiology, even in other diseases. So you must need the programming language like the Python uh, or other R, R based tools or statistical tools to implement your own system. So it's a time to learn uh, new technological tools before entering into this field. So don't be afraid. I still remember uh, when I was studying from Dr. Honda. So he had a, a background of agriculture engineering, but he teaches us uh, digital image processing in C language. So uh, although I have a background of computer science and it was quite easy for me to understand the C language, but I was quite relaxed. Uh, okay, no issue, I know the C language. But when uh, only two or three weeks passed, I think uh, whatever the C language I learned, uh, it was finished within four weeks. So then he started advanced techniques and uh, the advanced methods and uh, gave us the assignments in the labs to develop uh, and code uh, in C language and try to retrieve the images and apply different algorithms on image processing. So that time I realized if uh, Dr. Honda can uh, understand and can develop uh, the, his own tools, uh, having knowledge of uh, agriculture engineering, so it is not difficult uh, for others as well to uh, develop and uh, implement their own language tool. So definitely, of course, it takes time, but by learning computer language, it will make you easy to understand and develop uh, the new tools and technologies. And definitely then you will be easily understand the web-based tools and technologies. So the next feature is uh, development of your own tools like web-based systems, mobile-based applications. But nowadays it's quite easy. Many uh, tools and companies are providing you just uh, easy interfaces uh, so you can just integrate and add those plugins and you can implement your system. So it's my advice. So don't be afraid from language, just try yes. to learn the language and your life will be easier. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank so you. with You're the right. time limitation, we can actually conclude the webinar session. To all the participants, I can inform that uh, there are some exams in the upcoming week. So the next session will be on 13th May. From that, every two weeks, we'll have a webinar from the alumni of RSGIS department. And thank you so much, Dr. Shahzad, for actually nicely explaining about your research and also giving the scope for the upcoming researchers. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you all for giving me opportunity. And I am thankful uh, for the Department of Remote Sensing and GIS for remembering me and calling me to no, my no, second home. No, hope yeah. to see you soon in AIT, sir. Yeah. Thank and, you very much. And stay healthy, thank you. sir. Oh, you. You. Uh, and one more thing, everyone, like if you have any questions or queries, you can directly email to rsgis at aat.asia or you can message us in Facebook in RSGIS webpage yeah. and Facebook so, page. Thank stay you. tuned and keep Thank in you. touch with us. Oh, we have many, many webinars is coming and most uh, benefits to uh, who are interested in RSGIS. Thank you. 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 Thank you.